So uh, this uh, wonderful book, The uh, Ermine of Chernobyl, is the last to be published in English, but the first to be written of a, a group of three books, uh, the other two being Memoirs of an Anti-Semite and The Snows of Yesteryear, both also fabulous, uh, that uh, Redzori considered to be related. Um, they do not share the same characters. Uh, one is nonfiction, the other two are fiction, and they come at things from very different uh, approach, and very different tones. So uh, in no conventional way is this a trilogy, but Grisha was just not conventional in any way, as you have gathered. Uh, the three do share Red Story's instantly recognizable authorial hallmarks. The indelibly vivid imagery and characters, a combination of dazzlingly elegant style, acuity of observation, and subtlety of thought. But what this group of three books shares in particular is an intense focus on a catastrophically volatile time and place, which uh, Ritzroy which examines as much as a condition of the spirit as a physical and historical entity. The time is the period between the two world wars, and the place is a large area that had belonged to the shredded Austro-Hungarian Empire. The eponymous Chernobyl is a small, tumultuous, imaginary frontier town on the former empire's eastern fringes, and the inhabitants, as Beatrice indicated, are from all kinds of different cultural, ethnic, linguistic groups, and all of the conflicts and contradictions of the area, embraced in the area, are embraced in the book, with its swirling array of characters, totally outrageous, and the wild, rich plot full of all the things that Beatrice mentioned, as well as violence, betrayal, seduction, nobleness, criminality, all kinds of things. Um, so the narrative we, which you'll hear a certain amount of, refers to the narrator himself, who's a young boy at the outset of the book, and his siblings. Their home is genteel but disorderly, and it's full of relatives and dependents of various sorts. And the only one of the siblings we actually meet is a sort of blissful, dignified, <coughs> sensitive sister called Tanya. But actually, there, you kind of gather there's a little mob of kids. Wally and I are not going to make any attempt at all to give you an overview of the absolute thicket of a plot. Um, and instead, we've chosen to pick up passages <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> that follow, <clears throat> I know, <laughs> that follow the education of the children. And uh, incidentally, we've done a lot of cutting within these very intricate passages. Um, so, the red streetcars came rattling out of the green shade of the trees. There, the line narrowed to a single track, which ran towards the ed edge of town where the playing fields of the ethnically aligned sports club, Mercea Dobosch, Turnfather Jan, and Maccabee adjoined the broad grounds of the cavalry barracks. For years, it was our passionate wish to be allowed to ride one of these red cars, even for just a short stretch, but we had to wait patiently until this wish was fulfilled. Incidentally, the reason for this ban was not due to any particular danger associated with using the streetcar, but rather because of the near manic fear of infection harbored by our governess, an English woman by the name of Miss Rappaport. Actually, no one in our household really believed she was British, <laughs> even if in some respects she was so Anglo-Saxon 
it verged on caricature. And it's true. She was not born on the Isles themselves, but rather on Gibraltar, the daughter of a Mr. Rappaport in the shipping business, and a woman classified as an Anglo-Spaniard. But despite that, she was every bit the cliched, colorless, gaunt, and prognathous English governess anyone could wish for. Naturally, the story of her clearly complicated and scarcely typical background could not escape the attention of those who claimed to see through her all too well, so that in our family circle, she was simply called the Jewess. <laughs> People also took care to see that she did not come into contact with the dogs, who were very pure breeds, and for whom she felt a genuine British love. On the other hand, she was given nearly absolute control over our education. She placed great value in honing our English pronunciation into what she referred to as the King's English, always with a respectful tremble that elicited ironic glances among the adults who happened to be present as if her monarchic convictions amounted to a typical Jewish presumptuousness. Her method was the simplest and best. She had us repeat the same sentence for hours, and I will never forget the nuances she was able to detect and coax out of the simple construction, Herbert was murdered. <laughs> From a tone of extreme indignation, such as only an English government, uh, governess is capable of, through one of matter-of-fact declaration, up to a positively gleeful communication, we ran through the entire gamut of emotional possibilities under her inexhaustibly patient instructions, with all the gentle vocal variations and shadings of the vowels that merely hint at the R, rather than let it be heard. And I am convinced that no language instruction was suited to convey the English character so purely as one that places the student in a position to pronounce with fresh, bright-eyed assurance, Hebert was mad at them. <laughs> So eventually, Miss Rappaport is uh, dismissed, and uh, then the next tutor was dismissed, and finally, the parents rather reluctantly uh, take the children to a school. And the school was recommended by the children's uncle, Uncle Sergei, and also by the town prefect, Herr Tarangolian, who is a friend of the woman who uh, runs the school. Madame Aratonovich. Madame Aratonovich was the first woman we ever saw in pants. <laughs> the day we met her, she was wearing a kind of Chinese garment, black silk jacket with wide sleeves lined with cherry red fabric, and broad white silk pants with high-heeled slippers. She was ghostly pale. She was smoking a cigarette through a thin jade holder the length of her arm. <laughs> you are a charming little flock of chickadees, she said with a voice that was alarmingly full and deep. As I told your mother and her rather sour companion, the most important thing a good school can teach is a small dose of cynicism. <laughs> Do you know what that is? We said we didn't, and we're very eager to learn. <laughs> That's the word used to differentiate smart people and dumb ones. <laughs> Please take note of that, because we'll never speak about it again. <laughs> Perhaps people will tell you something completely different later on, and when they do, you should think of me. Or else, think of the story about Queen Victoria and Prince Edward. She caught him cheating at cards. Do you know what happens to little boys who cheat at games? She asked, in English. 
To which he replied, yes, they win. <laughs> and I remember as if it were today that we suddenly saw how beautiful Madame Aratanovich was in an entirely different way than the somewhat shallow, white, golden, good looks that had been our only model for beauty up to then. She was so thin that the delicate bone structure of her skull seemed to be covered with nothing but skin, or perhaps just a layer of powder. Her face was a death mask. Only her eyes were full of the splendor of life. So the parents don't really know anything about the school, and the children, of course, have made new friends, specifically a little boy named Solly Brill, very entertaining little boy, whose father is a shopkeeper, and this marvelous little girl, Blanche Schlesinger, whose father is a psychiatrist who works at the local uh, asylum. Um, I've already mentioned that we didn't concern ourselves with the religion of our new friends, nor, in fact, that of most of our classmates. But I would be straying very far indeed from the truth if I were to claim we didn't know what kind of instruction we were receiving every week from a certain Dr. Aaron Zaltzman. We had never discussed or planned our participation. We simply took it for granted that we would take part in that course, just like the majority of our classmates, and above all, like our close friends, Blanche Schlesinger and <coughs> Solly Brill. Only Solly Brill <coughs> expressed his surprise the first time he saw us in Dr. Saltzman's class. What's this, he said. I thought you were little Goyam. <laughs> You're not even circumcised. Well, so much the better. We'll sit through Hader together. <laughs> Blanche, however, appeared to see through our friendly deception. <coughs> she said, my father often talks to me about Christ and the holy symbolism of his crucifixion. I'd become a Christian myself if it weren't for the fact that as soon as you do, you get attacked from all sides. <coughs> My father also thinks that people can feel Jewish and Christian at the same time. Thanks to the short time we spent in Dr. Saltzman's class, we never thought otherwise ourselves. Because what we heard there and learned was a beautiful reverence for God and an equally beautiful tolerance, wise and smiling. In talking about the agonizing history of the Jews, Dr. Saltzman was not simply dishing out the murky broth of nationalistic feeling by citing the hardships of the fathers. His goal was to emphasize the steadfastness of belief that had been handed down through the generations. Untold hordes of old and young, men, mothers, children, had been tortured to death upholding the precept of Kiddush Hashem in the praise of the one whose name cannot be taken in vain. But most of all, we loved this class on account of the teacher. Dr. Aaron Saltzman had a captivating way of treating each of us as creatures that were at once human and all too human, whose understanding of the world, from the least things to the greatest, was limited solely by our lack of practice in clear and logical thinking. He accepted neither ignorance nor stupidity, which he considered mere excuses. Whenever he encountered a lack of understanding, he never lost his patience, but closed his eyes, arched his eyebrows, and repeated the question or sentence that had not been immediately, immediately understood in his soft, rich tenor, adding a sigh of ponderous contentment for as long as it took until he finally came out with the explanation or answer himself. He was very fat. His stomach stuck out so far it seemed to push him backwards. His face had a glossy reddish tinge with the olive undertone of his race, and he had sparkling black eyes and a thick, assertive mustache. His bearing was warlike, 
Embedded in the cushions of fat around his cheeks, we could still make out the features of his youth, the face of a young David, bold, clear, and beautiful. A profusion of oily ringlets formed a wreath around his neck inside his collar, which was always a little grimy. Because there was no bell to mark the end of this last period on Wednesday mornings, it occasionally happened that Dr. Saltzman kept us past time in the classroom. This would prove to be our undoing. <laughs> For one day, Aunt Elvira, who had come to pick us up, no longer had the patience to wait for us outside the Institute. Aunt Elvira entered the classroom with the put-on smile of grown-ups who view children as half-dangerous, half-idiotic creatures. She nodded and uttered a semi-sour, semi-friendly, good morning, which Dr. Saltzman answered with a sonorous, relaxed, indeed it is. Aunt Elvira's smile froze at the sight of his black yarmulke, which he stared at as if transfixed. The revelation that the Institut d'Education was a pure Jewish school, where classes were taught in Hebrew, was first met with disbelief at home. But when, when asked, we had to confess that we'd been taking part in Jewish religious instruction this set off one of the usual crises. Our mother sought out Madame Artanovich, who listened to her carefully, and then said, didn't you know that I'm Jewish myself? Not a syllable of that was true. Both Herr Terengolian and Uncle Sergei took pains to rebut this claim as tactfully as possible. But even as they did, our parents remained resolute in their decision to remove us immediately from the school. We cried for days. Now they actually, uh, Herr Tarangolian and Uncle Sergei were upset about the idea of removing the children immediately and there was a kind of negotiation and Finally, it was agreed that they would stay uh, till the end of the term. And uh, the climax of the term was to be a performance of The Nutcracker, <laughs> featuring uh, Tanya, the narrator's sister, as the sugar plum fairy. And Madame Aratonovich had been a, uh, a ballet dancer at one time, and that was why she was so interested in this. Well, on the same night, that that performance was scheduled at the school, on the other side of town there was a soccer match organized between the ethnic German soccer team and the Jewish soccer team. Despite their animosity toward Madame Aratonovich's Institut d'Education, our mother and even Aunt Elvira had agreed to watch the ballet for our sake. The performance was to begin at 7 o'clock. Uncle Sergei had promised to come later. Our father had left town to go hunting. We loaded the costumes into the carriage and set off. The noise from the playing field had become constant, tumultuous, disquieting. Outside the officer's casino, a platoon of gendarmes was being sworn in. A man with a badly bleeding head passed by, kicking and screaming and struggling against the two companions who were escorting him. We turned off the main street and stopped in front of the institute. Our mother looked at Dr. Saltzman. Mama spoke a few half-friendly words about how she hoped our inadvertent participation in his course had not wounded the sensitivities of any of the other pupils' parents. Absolutely not, Gnadica Frau. Jewish parvenus are usually quite tolerant. <laughs> well, that's reassuring, said our mother, <laughs> nodding to Dr. Saltzman. Not for me, he replied. Among the better off members of the Mosaic faith, at most 60% still believe in a personal God. The remaining 40% do not. 
the truth lies somewhere in the middle, as usual. Those of us with convictions would prefer to see a better proportion. <laughs> we were shooed into the bedroom that had been designed as our dressing room. A few latecomers arrived and reported that the soccer match had been broken off because a tumult had erupted. The fighting was still going on and had spread into the city. Reinforced squads of police and gendarmes were trying to restore the peace. They started getting us into costume and applying makeup. The theater barber and his assistant applied scented creams to our foreheads and cheeks, dusted us with powder that tickled our noses, and under the careful supervision of Madame Aratanovich, shaped Tanya's and Blanche's eyebrows into the wingtips of demonic butterflies. <laughs> Meanwhile, more disquieting news continued to filter in about what was going on in the streets. Evidently, the police, heavily reinforced by the gendarmerie, had managed to restore order outside the playing field. However, it was time for the daily promenade, which usually filled Yanku Torpor Avenue with alarming masses of people. But today, it was positively frightening to find out how many inhabitants Chernobyl really possessed and what kind of people they were. Apparently, the entire rabble from the outlying districts had formed a mob. The Matsyorniks from around the train station, accompanied by hordes of streetwalkers, the Borlocks from the settlements around Kalachnabok, and the hooligans from Blokuchka roamed across the avenue so that even the spacious folks garden was practically overflowing. Even the fashionable pachkas of young flaneurs had armed themselves with sticks. The ethnic German fraternity, Germania, wearing the colors of their club, with ribbons and caps and provocative glances, approached anyone coming their way, and the John Athletic Club was in the beer cellar of the Deutsches House, ready to spring to action as a man to the cry, brothers, come out. And finally, it was impossible to overlook the throngs of young Jews, including some who were practically children, who were streaming in from all sides. Mama Brill hadn't returned to the Institute. Said Sally, what I want most of all is to be out on the street myself. But no, it's a snowflake I have to be playing the one time something <laughs> fun is going on outside. We asked Blanche about her mother. I don't have a mother anymore, she said. You couldn't have known. She died two years ago. And your father? Is he here? No, he wanted to come, but he was called to the asylum. I'm all by myself. We began to grow apprehensive. Report after unsettling report alarmed us to the point where we lost our joyful anticipation of the ballet. Seven o'clock came, but Madame Aratanovich gave no sign to begin. Uncle Sergei arrived late. Giving his most charming smile, he said, the mood on the streets is just like before a revolution. I saw someone almost beaten into mincemeat. <laughs> At 7.30, Madame Aratanovich asked Dr. Saltzman to go to the corner apothecary and telephone to see if the prefect would be able to attend. Dr. Saltzman set off with eyes ablaze and martial mustache twitching and never came back. <laughs> but the parents had already decided to put off the performance to another day. The way things were, it was time to get the children home as quickly as possible. Please, said Madame, consider the fact that right now is the worst possible time to be driving through the city. At least wait till after the promenade. Besides, I don't believe that anything serious is going to happen. There's no reason for she interrupted herself. What was that? Someone asked. Those were gunshots. For a few seconds, all of us in the festively decorated Institut d'Education <coughs> were deathly silent. 
we heard the same roaring crowd that we had heard in the afternoon coming from the playing field, except now they sounded much closer. We heard a noise as though a handful of beans were being tossed into a bucket. After that, it went quiet for a moment, and then the noise broke out again, louder and higher by a whole tone. We could now make out individual voices, very agitated, shouting, a salvo, observed Uncle Sergei gleefully. Panic broke out among the grown-ups, though not among us children. They threw coats on top of our costumes, grabbed our clothes, and fled to the carriages. What you are doing is insane, Madame Aratonovich cried out. Don't go out onto the street right now while there's shooting going on. It's bound to be over very soon. That was just a warning, one of them countered. If things don't come down after that, then the shooting will really start in earnest, and we want to be home before then. That point of view was compelling and ultimately proved correct. <laughs> Our mother was inclined to stay in the Institute until the worst was over, but Aunt Elvira said, I wouldn't take the risk of waiting in a school like this. The bitterness is clearly directed toward Jews. Uncle Sergei also thought it would be better to return to the villa district, which would be relatively free from danger. If you decide to go, said Madame Aratonovich, please take little Brill and Blanche Schlesinger and see that they get home. They're both on their own here. Yes, but you have teachers from your institute at your disposal, said Aunt Elvira. For us, it would mean taking a long detour through downtown. That's true, said Madame Aratonovich, but we don't have a carriage. Please, do it for the sake of your children's friendship with them. Of course, said our mother. After all, we have Sergei to protect us. Our coachman was a long-serving, reliable man who we brought from the country. Ah, that's nothing, he said. People beating on each other like at the fairgrounds, knocking out window panes, firing into the air to chase everyone away. We'll put up the covers so we don't catch a stone on the nose, that's all. I'll see that everyone gets home. Uncle Sergei sat heroically next to him on the box. And in fact, the noise seemed to have passed in the direction of the folks' garden. The pavement was strewn with shards of glass, but otherwise empty. At the main street, however, we ran into the commotion. Our coachman charged so fiercely into a mob of suspicious characters that a few of them barely escaped getting run over. One stone hit the cover of the carriage. Sally Brill was fidgeting between us anxiously, as much as the cramped space allowed. There's our shop, he called out. Look at what they're doing, the pigs! Some of the rabble was in the process of systematically demolishing the Brill's store. The roller shutters were torn off, the windows shattered. A few men had crawled into the display window and were tossing the wares to the others outside. Look at the robbers! Sally cried. He jumped up and clambered onto Aunt Elvira's lap, stuck his head out the window and shouted full of tears, why does it always have to be us? Aren't there any other Jews? He was pulled in as quickly as possible. <laughs> but then we saw something that made us shout with jubilation. From the darkness of the chestnut trees in front of the provincial government offices, a troop emerged and fell upon the plundering mob like a flock of avenging angels. They were muscular young men dressed in white linen pants covered with flour. Their shirts were open and their heads were covered with little visorless felt caps, apprentices from the numerous kosher bakeries. Swinging their long wooden peels like double-edged swords, they mowed their way through the streets like threshers and leading them into battle was a Jewish Mars, a stout god of war, powerful and glorious in his ecstatic rage. His fat face flushed red like David when he became a man, his black eyes flashing behind the high cushions of his cheeks, his mustache bristling furiously over his scarlet lips, 
and a greasy wreath of black ringlets on his neck. It was Dr. Saltzman in his hour of greatness. <laughs> we turned away toward theater plots. Around the synagogue, we could see the glow of fire. Evidently, a real battle was underway there. Soldiers with fixed bayonets were running diagonally across the plaza as if attacking. Our coachman drove calmly ahead in a quick, steady trot, then turned onto a side street that led into a somewhat elevated lot where circuses set up their tents, but which now was empty. Just before the small rise, the coachman brought the horses to a gallop and had them take the embankment in three bounds. We were shaken through and through, but soon the carriage was again rolling smoothly on the hard-packed ground. The shortcut was cleverly chosen, since it allowed us to avoid the streets that might be jammed with soldiers, and we approached the Brill's house from the rear. Uncle Sergei leaped from the box and helped Sally out. Don't worry about me, Sally said. Just keep driving. I'll make it home on my own. But my mother insisted that we wait for him. We stood parked for a few minutes in the shade of the bare firewalls that stood around the garbage bins. Then Uncle Sergei came back. Sally's mother and sister weren't yet home. The father cried when he hugged his son. We drove back across the empty circus grounds. Blanche was sitting between Tanya and me. It was the first time that I had been so close to her and could feel her body against my own. Tanya and I had our fingers clasped over one of her hands. The sky above the empty lot was dark, outlined only in the background by the lanterns along Vasagasa. Blanche raised her other hand laid it around my cheek and pulled my head to hers. I felt her thick, hard, curly hair. Her cheeks touched just briefly. Then she withdrew her hand. I was overwhelmed by the sweetness of this chaste, almost holy touch. All the bodily emotions of my dreams suddenly seemed like pale shadows of an almost painful irreality. Although this too was only a dream, as it happened so unforeseen and passed so quickly and so irretrievably. At that point, a man ran diagonally across the street and we heard two or three shots ring out behind him. The man flung up his arms, stood for a moment like a black cross, then staggered ahead, stumbled, and <coughs> collapsed on his face. And the wheels of our carriage rolled a hair's breadth away from his legs, which were still twitching. Tanya cried out. I could feel Blanche trembling, but the coachman kept the horses at a constant steady trot. We drove up to the Herz Jesu church, whose stone towers jutted hypocritically into the violet sky. Outside the nearby police headquarters, we saw helmets gleaming under the bright light of the arc lamps that formed a whitish bell as it illuminated the forecourt where an officer was shouting commands. Blanche and her father lived in a building behind the Ukrainian high school. Blanche jumped up as soon as we turned onto the short street. The apartments were all fronted by narrow, fenced-in garden beds. Only one of the buildings, the one where Blanche and her father lived, appeared to have been vandalized, but thoroughly. Even the cast iron fence had been torn out of its base, the pieces scattered on the street like giant waffles. Both windows on the second story had been shattered. Bed linens were hanging out of one, and a ruined chair was caught in a shrub in front of the other. All manner of household goods lay strewn about, mostly books. At one place, they were piled into a heap that had been set on fire before other people had doused it with water that was now running into a black puddle. A group of men stood facing the devastation. One of them was wearing a tattered coat and a torn shirt, and his face was bleeding. Father, cried Blanche. She had jumped out of the carriage even before it could come to a stop and threw herself in his arms. 
Dr. Schlesinger had a gaping wound above his temple with a moist handkerchief pressed against it. His eyes were bruised and practically closed shut. One corner of his mouth was torn. Even his hands were hurt and bloody. He could barely move them. My child, he said, how good that you're here. I was just about to go looking for you. Now everything is all right. There, there, it's all over. We'll put things back to order. One of the neighbors standing by stuck his head in our carriage. One is ashamed to live in a world like this, he said. They beat him half to death and threatened to hang him. If we weren't so close to the police station, they might have done it too. But the police are content just to look on or even take part if possible. Dr. Schlesinger came to our carriage. Thank you for bringing my daughter home safely, he said. You're wounded, said our mother. You and Blanche should come to our house and spend the night. The child can't be left in this devastation, and you need looking after. Thank you, Gnadige Frau. We have kind neighbors that have offered to take us in. I'm sure you'll understand that I first want to put things back in order as much as possible. Some scientific works that mean a lot to me have been destroyed. You are very kind, and I thank you. But you are clearly the person they're targeting. The violence isn't over yet. You may still be in danger. I'm sure I'm not, Gnadige Frau. They did what they set out to do. Now it's all over. We'll be putting things back in order now. He stroked Blanche's head. Once again, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Blanche broke away from him to come to us but then turned around and ran into the damaged building. Dr. Schlesinger nodded to our mother. You should take your children home, Gnadige Frau. As you see, I have help. Blanche and I are not alone. And I know every single one of them, one woman said. I can name each one by name. They should be publicly whipped, the lot of them. Dr. Schlesinger smiled, resigned. Our mother signaled the coachman to drive on. Our street was empty. Nothing had happened here. The whole commotion had passed by almost unnoticed. We were given a cup of tea with a good dose of rum and sent straight to bed. <laughs> Uncle Sergei came to our room to wish us good night. Was he dead, the man they shot, we asked? What man, my hearts? the one who fell next to our carriage. No, never, he just stumbled. I saw how he happily got up and went on running. <laughs> That's not true, Uncle Sergei, you're lying to us. Uncle Sergei was quiet for a moment. Would you rather believe the alternative? We didn't know what to answer. No, and yes. Does it hurt when a person gets shot to death, we asked? Not a bit. You don't feel any more than when you get whacked with a finger. Tuck, and it's all over. It's no fun at all to shoot someone dead. The children should go to sleep now, our mother said. We'll be right nearby, and we'll leave all the doors open. Behind the gardens outside our windows, the darkness was rocking the treetops in the folks garden. The song of the nightingales rose from there and echoed off the walls of the night. Apart from that, there was no sound. The next morning, we were running a fever and stayed in bed. Toward evening, Tanya had a big reddish patch on her forehead and cheeks. The doctor was called. He diagnosed scarlet fever. No wonder in that Jew school, our father said, who had just returned from his hunting trip and had yet to hear what had transpired. So I'm going to finish up with a very short uh, little passage. Um, uh, as you may have gathered, from even some of the little bits we've read, a constant haunting motif of the book is degradation, the degradation of a place, of a culture, of a soul. And 
Um, this short passage illustrates Retsori's insight that damage to an original purity of feeling is related to the consciousness both of one's life and of one's mortality. So here's the narrator recovering from his bout of scarlet fever. As I recovered, I could feel how I was being cheapened, how my senses, which my ailment had phoned to, honed to a fine, excitable edge, were again getting sucked into the undertow of life that struck me as full of fake cheer that seemed artificially packed with pointless actions and gestures and overflowing with wholesome precepts, all aimed at deliberate deception. And the harder people work to peddle this concept of worthy life, the more they aroused my suspicion. Consequently, while I hated the dishes that were designed to make me stronger, and which with every meal were meatier, spicier, more masculine, so to speak, what disgusted me even more was the fact that my appetite for them was growing. And as much as I despised the eager voices full of anticipation and modulated to cheer me up as if wanting to transfer their own impatience onto me, just a few more days, then you'll be able to get out and get some fresh air and play with the others. I'll bet you can't wait, can you? I detested the excitement that I felt against my will and which was all too closely related to that uncouth cheerfulness. I had the feeling as though now were the time for me to leave my childhood once and for all. Because what was expected of me, this ideal of being healthy and taking part in all life's joys and duties, meant renouncing the earnestness I had developed in the great unconscious tension of my unmediated confrontation with the world. I was sensing that my own ability to experience things was diminishing as I recovered. There was clearly a limit, not of the wonders that surrounded me, but of my strength to perceive them, as if my soul, which had once again been exiled to my body, possessed only a limited facility to comprehend, an unalterable capacity that could contain a finite quantity of basic images and not a single one more. Hesitantly then, and with an anticipatory sadness, since I was growing out of my childhood anyway and registering the renunciations that this entailed, I took leave of my sick room, within whose walls everything had been calibrated to my sickness with gentle consideration and tender care, and which was filled with the echoes of heightened perceptions that had grown in time and space and which I had savored to the fullest, just like my aches and pains. For years, I wasn't able to pick up a book or look at a picture that I had studied then without feeling the vague stimulus of a deeper recognition, an impact that strikes the core of our being, the sense of deja vu mingled with nostalgia that comes when we re-encounter motifs from our childhood and we regret having lost the power to experience the world in a way that brought us closer to the essence of things.